Thanks for watching, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching uh, Wednesday Debate Live, and I'm Taghreed Hussain. Uh, tonight, we'll be talking about Egypt's developmental revolution. Not leaving anyone behind is considered to be one of the main motors of uh, the new republic. This has been made clear uh, through Egypt's sustainable development goals that were adopted by the government in order to provide Egyptians with uh, a decent and a better life. The political leadership recognizes definitely the action in one area that will affect the outcomes and have a reflection on others. And that comprehensive development will definitely balance the country's social, economic and environmental sustainability. Guided by the principle of leaving no one behind and committed to realizing our vision, Egypt's vision 2030, Egypt has prioritized uh, tackling the developmental projects in the different governorates level in order to provide the citizens with job opportunities and uh, with quality education, with good health services and a secure, better life for all Egyptians. No doubt that throughout the last years we've seen the government and in partnership with the relevant stakeholders continues the efforts in order to uh, implement those goals and the SDGs, especially in the various fields. Uh, the president's inauguration that we've seen uh, today in Upper Egypt is proving how uh, work is actually uh, done and happening around the clock in order uh, to improve the workers' living conditions and build the Egyptian character amidst the countless uh, challenges. Well, uh, tonight we'll be tackling this important file. We'll be reading more uh, the president's remarks through this very important visit uh, to Asyut and to Upper Egypt. Uh, the president had opened earlier in the day major developmental projects in Upper Egypt. Uh, this report highlights uh, those important projects and we'll be back for discussion. President Abdel Fattah Sisi inaugurated on Wednesday a major complex for producing petroleum products at the Asyut Petroleum Refining Company in Upper Egypt, in addition to several infrastructure projects in the region. During the inauguration, President Sisi urged the private companies to participate in the implementation project as part of the state's approach to engage the private sector. The president added that the projects inaugurated today, or those soon to be inaugurated in Upper Egypt, reflect the state's keenness to overcome challenges nationwide. President Assisi also called for facing the phenomenon of construction on the agricultural lands, saying that Egyptians have been constructing units on the limited agricultural lands over the past 60 to 70 years, despite the extended desert. In this regard, the president stressed that his only goal is to preserve the Egyptian state along with the efforts being made to achieve progress and prosperity amid the population growth. During the event taking place in Asyut today, President Assisi inaugurated over video conference a number of other infrastructure projects in the region, including the Abu Qulqas water plant, a hospital for treating liver disease in Deir Mawas Central Hospital, Malawi Specialized Hospital and Samalut Model Hospital in Minya. The president also inaugurated water plants projects in Qina, the faculty and hospital of dentistry and the University of Asyut, the children's specialized hospital and ISIS hospital for women and childbirth in Luxor and a hospital for mental health in Suhaig. In a speech during the event, Prime Minister Mustafa Madbouli said that the state has drawn a comprehensive plan to develop Upper Egypt, stressing that the state has put the development of Upper Egypt at the top of its priorities. The Premier added that the state has been working to improve the quality of life for Egyptian citizens by implementing several development projects worth 1.1 trillion Egyptian pounds with a successful... Today was actually a very important uh, day for uh, Upper Egypt and the president promised Egyptians to compensate them for uh, what they went through in the last 30 years as Egypt sets into motion the largest comprehensive uh, modernization uh, process uh, in the country. Uh, we're really honored to have with us uh, Professor Dr. Mohamed Fahmi, Professor of Economics and Political Science at AUC. Thank you so much, Professor, Thanks for, for joining you. us on Night TV. 
Thanks. And uh, together we'll be reading this important headline and uh, also uh, track more the developmental projects all over Egypt. Uh, today is a historic day for Upper Egypt, Professor, and uh, we've seen uh, uh, how uh, the reactions of the people welcoming the president. And uh, it was uh, a very warm welcome and at the same time uh, the announcement of more achievements uh, historic achievements actually that has never happened before in Asyut, what we saw earlier today. Yes, I think the area of Upper Egypt has for a very long time unfortunately and unrightly been neglected mm -hmm. um, since maybe the modern period, you know, despite the fact that a lot of the resources, the manpower, the expertise, the know-how, I mean most of Egypt's major figures, if you look at, you know, since the beginning of the 20th century, have actually come from that part of the country. So, in addition to this being a, a source of, of um, you know, creativity, of human intelligence, of knowledge, there's also a lot of resources, physical and material, to be capitalized upon in that area. So, I think it's a very encouraging sign, what we hear today from the Egyptian state regarding this initiative, and hopefully more initiatives, to um, utilize and to develop this part of the country, hopefully also not only in terms of projects on the short term, but also on the long term, uh, investing in this part of the country. That's very, very important. Yes, very, very important, talking also the long term, as uh, you said, Professor. And concerning the long term, we're working on uh, sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. We're working on leaving no one behind, which is very mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this uh, translated into action today in, in Upper Egypt. Uh, well, uh, Egypt uh, localization of the SDGs and their contribution to this factor of leaving no one behind, in your opinion. Yes. Uh, you know, one of the things, for instance, and I think that was also, I think, one of the major projects that were initialized uh, today uh, was the opening of this new station for the production of, of gas within Upper Egypt itself. For a very long time, uh, we saw Upper Egypt depending on resources coming from other parts of the country, from North Egypt, from Sinai, from the Northwestern region, from Cairo, of course. But now we are, we are I think we're seeing a shift in the trend to uh, try and localize yeah. the production within Upper Egypt itself. So instead mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of bearing the cost of transportation uh, for, again, resources such as gas, such as um, uh, other sources of energy, for instance, you know, electricity. Mm -hmm. Having this hub built and established within Upper Egypt will definitely help and, you, and, and, and make it much easier, facilitate the process of development in that part of the country. Yes, having this hub built, as uh, uh, you've said, Professor Fahmi, uh, definitely entails also that we would have the private sector uh, mm -hmm. taking part and participating. Uh, how do you see the role of the private sector and the importance uh, of the role of the private sector in uh, contributing to the mega development projects all over Egypt today? I think it's extremely vital for mm -hmm. the private sector. I mean, for a while now, Egypt's economy has been depending uh, to a great extent on the role of the private sector. We see that in the different uh, um, uh, areas of production throughout the country. But now it's time also for the private sector to play its role. I think the state has already uh, provided incentives in terms of um, tax yeah. uh, uh, remissions and in terms of several other uh, facilities that would um, ease the process of building uh, projects, mm -hmm. whether uh, industrial or agricultural, also in terms of trade. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of facilities provided by the state to make it easier for the private investor to um, work more and produce more in that part of the country. I think there has already been a number of industries yeah. in Upper Egypt. I mean, we have, for instance, Nag Hammadi, the aluminum uh, you know, factory, we've had it there since the 1960s. More recently, some private sector entities have started to build some you know, projects there. We have some you know, in Beniswaif and especially in Minya, but again, not enough, not, mm -hmm. not sufficient by any means. So this, um, you know, I think opportunity, this orientation on the part of the state, this encouragement should also be met with a lot more investment and productive activities from the private sector. Yes, and this is what Prime Minister Madbouli had highlighted actually in his speech today while talking about uh, 
uh, seven years of uh, mega development projects and achievements in the country and uh, he said that over the past seven years uh, also those projects are uh, being held in Upper Egypt and mainly aim at raising the standard of living of uh, our brotherly Egyptians living there and uh, also utilizing the region's uh, natural resources. Well, uh, as youth petroleum complex, how far will it make a difference in your opinion and also uh, not only in Asyut, but also to the neighboring yeah. area, neighboring governorates. Yeah, a, a very big impact, I think. Very, mm -hmm. very big impact. Just like we just mentioned, you know, yeah. it will definitely facilitate the sources of energy. You know, mm -hmm. in order for there to be development, you need energy. You need, um, you know, also sustainable energy, electricity, and mm -hmm. gas itself in terms of transportation for vehicles, for different, um, uh, also uh, factories using the, these energies. So w when you have the hub built in Upper Egypt and also in Asyut, this is not northern Upper Egypt, we're not talking about many or Beni Suif. This is Asyut, which is in a very central location to also serve other areas within Upper Egypt like Luxor, like uh, Qina, like Sohag. So it's, it's a very central also location for this production hub. So I think it does make a difference and it should play a major role. Now this will facilitate, this will also lower the cost of production. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll make it again a much bigger incentive for the private sector, for the different companies to start directing their um, financial mm. uh, you know, activities into not only Upper Egypt, but also to the southern part of Upper Egypt, which again, according to most of the indicators of development, is the most uh, needy part of, of, of Upper Egypt, really. Yes, and uh, this has happened also through the Decent uh, Life Initiative or Haya Karima mm -hmm. uh, that has uh, uh, definitely left a positive impact on the lives of uh, Egyptians in the rural areas and uh, in Upper Egypt. It mm -hmm. had changed the face uh, uh, of life in the country. The Egyptian villages within the last also three years had witnessed a lot of approach addressing the different dimensions of uh, sustainable development and its goals so how do you see the sense of devotion and the state attention today to the rural areas especially and to Upper Egypt through the Decent Life Initiative? Yes, it's, it's a multifaceted effort. And I mm -hmm. think the government mentioned that and asserted that in different ways, that this cannot be an effort only done by the state. So on the one hand, you have the government investing in areas such as education, health, very, mm -hmm. very important for sustainable mm -hmm. development. And they will take time in order to you know, bear the fruits of such activities. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, this has to be also coupled with a lot of work from other parts of the, the state structure, from the civil society and from, from the, from the uh, private sector. Both of them have to work together here in tandem to provide more opportunities for the unemployed. Again, you have a huge uh, set of manpower within Upper Egypt, a lot of youth there. Again, the, there's what we can call the youth bulge, mm -hmm. a lot of educated, young people looking for work and opportunities and they end up traveling either to other parts of Egypt or outside of Egypt. You know, when you look at most of the labor migration happening from Egypt, most of it comes from Upper Egypt. So here you have an opportunity also for this brain drain to stop. You have an opportunity to build on the skill set of the already existing youth within Upper Egypt. And uh, in order to do so, you have to invest. And this is a, a good starting point. There are still a lot of challenges, of course, because mm -hmm. you know the way to development is a long way. It will take some time, but it's a very good starting point, and hopefully, hopefully, it will only continue in the coming period. Yes, uh, definitely, it's very a, a very important point, as uh, you've mentioned, uh, Professor Wisely, concerning uh, the youth and uh, unleashing their potential and mm -hmm. uh, seizing this opportunity to make them like hands-on, because. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, today in the country we have many dreams and it's very important to engage the youth. We have uh, a World Youth Forum actually around the corner. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe this is also going to be a very attractive point, talking about the youth role uh, today and how they could be uh, like uh, giving a hand in the decision-making process in the country and giving a hand also in upgrading Upper Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, definitely. If we talk about empowerment, it's not only empowerment in terms of the youth, you know, sharing their views or, mm -hmm. you know, voicing out their opinions, which is very important, of course, and we need it yeah, to a great extent they for need them to, be listened to. to take yeah. part mm -hmm. in the decision making process. And we see, you know, I would say some uh, hints of that in different uh, government rates. Now we start seeing more assistance to governors who come from this youth segment, you know, so more MPs also from 
um, different you know, youth groups also. We see also a, a representation of that in the parliament. So these are all um, encouraging signs. But the most important thing is to also provide them with social and economic opportunities for them to be you know, present in the fabric of the country in terms of production and development. So this will only happen by providing opportunities as such, by building more factories, by encouraging them to take part in the different sectors. You know, Egypt has a huge potential in a variety of sectors. Mm -hmm. And we need to capitalize on it. But this will not happen without the participation, the active participation of the youth. So coupled with improving the social sector, education and health, you also need to provide the youth with opportunities. And again, Upper Egypt is a great starting point for that. Yes, definitely. Uh, providing also uh, this sense of decent life uh, before the whole world. Mm -hmm. uh, let me tell you more about how the, uh, the whole world is uh, also watching the Decent Life Initiative mm -hmm. as an initiative that is providing the comprehensive concept of human rights mm -hmm. uh, in Egypt. And it embodies, of course, the state's vision vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, social justice. Mm -hmm. So um, this initiative and this reflection globally, how do you see this reflection globally concerning the Decent Life Initiative? Well, I think, you know, we've heard this sort of debate several times, the trade-off between, um, you know, social and political rights vis-a-vis uh, -vis economic rights. And it's very important here for all them rights to be, uh, you know, offered or presented or empowered equally. We cannot possibly talk of one set of rights and neglect the others. And economic opportunities in a country that's been, you know, hit by poverty and by income disparities for a very long time, like Egypt, is I would say the most important of them all. We need really, I mean, unless the youth are empowered enough in terms of their livelihood, in terms of their job opportunities, in terms of their decent life, as the initiative is um, uh, properly titled, you yeah. know, they won't be able to really participate in political or social spheres. So, you know, all of them, all of them rights have to be, um, you know, focused upon and uh, supported and harbored by the state. Uh, but talking here about economic rights in particular, I think this is, again, very, very important mm -hmm. because I mean, the world sees several things. I mean, the world is also interested in business opportunities. You have a lot of, you know, especially the West and Western, you know, companies, MNCs, international financial institutions, they're interested also in seeing a thriving economy. Mm -hmm. A thriving economy can only happen with, you know, support and development happening in the different sectors throughout the country. So we cannot possibly, Egypt cannot possibly play a role or develop further without, I mean, leaving the upper Egyptian uh, uh, part of it behind. You know, yeah. this has to be an integral part of the developmental process. I think it's happening and hopefully it will continue in the coming period. Uh, it is happening. We're really glad that it is happening. And uh, uh, as we've seen earlier in the day in his remarks, the president focused on the fact that it is quite also uh, important uh, to uh, have absolute, he has definitely absolute confidence in, in Egypt's youth and uh, mentioning uh, education and also uh, what is important is the fact that uh, confronting terrorism and extremism is through having the youth hands-on in the developmental process, as we were talking. So uh, they won't have uh, uh, that space for any sort of brainwashing. So we're confronting terrorism with development. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look at the different, you know, throughout maybe the past 20 or 30 years, most of the leaders of these groups have come from again, Upper Egypt. And this is not a coincidence, you know, it's, it's, it's not just like that, that they come from these parts. It's because of, again, for a very long time, this part of the country has been disregarded, has not received enough attention from the government. So, of course, you know, it's been left for other forces to create their own mindsets and shape and mm -hmm. influence the youth yeah. of these different uh, parts. So today, by investing in this part, you're also offsetting any attempts or any room or any gaps that can be filled or can be capitalized on by terrorist groups and by radical and, ex and, and extremist ideas. Mm -hmm. So definitely, yes, th this is a process that's multifaceted. And it can lead to many benefits. The economic and the social and the cultural rights are all coupled, are all, you know, in tandem together. Um, and again, it's just a starting point. There are so many challenges coming up because you need to build on that. You need to also make sure that the youth are taken part and that we also focus on the sectors that are mostly also needed mm -hmm. in these areas because you know the picture is also quite um, uh, diverse from mm -hmm. one part to another even within Upper Egypt itself. 
Yes, it is. Uh, the vision is, uh, is diverse and we have lots of opportunities uh, to be offered uh, to the youth. We'll be uh, talking about, uh, about the, the youth potential and how can we uh, be able to invest in the youth potential, uh, especially that we have this great festivity that uh, the whole world is looking uh, up to, which is uh, the World Youth Forum, the upcoming Youth Forum, and uh, that great opportunity for, for youth all over the world. Short break, we'll be back. <laughs> Well, uh, the president always stresses that he has absolute confidence in the Egyptian youth along with their sense of enthusiasm and determination to realize uh, the Egyptian genuine dream of building a homeland of honor and of pride and of dignity. And uh, Dr. Fahmi, with uh, having the World Youth Forum around the corner, lots of opportunities are there. And I guess this year is going also to witness letting the youth of the world see how the face of Egypt has changed through uh, the vision of the youth, through the youth and their, the, the opportunities that has been given to them. Uh, mind you, uh, we've seen uh, assistant governors who are youth today mm. in the decision-making posts, uh, assistant ministers. And uh, this, this in itself uh, is considered to be an achievement. So preparing youth for the decision-making uh, process. Yes, mm -hmm. it's definitely a good starting point, but I think there's still a lot that needs to be done. I mean, when you look at the rest of the world today, a few days ago, Chile elected its own president. And looking at the age group of the president, he was actually 35, mm -hmm. 35 years old. And he's the president of the entire country. And you see many examples of this. You know, Macron in France is from early 40s. You have other, you know, leader, world leaders in Canada, also Trudeau and other Latin America, Africa today. So I think it's time now for Egypt to also trust its youth in terms of actual decision-making mm -hmm. uh, uh, places. Yeah. It's, it's a starting point to have them in places such as assistant governor, governor such as uh, you know, leaders in different ministries, very important, but it's also important for them to take the responsibility because this is how you learn. And they will make mistakes. You know, it's all right if you make a mistake. You know, people make mistakes, but yeah. there's no way that we can learn without making mistakes. Mm -hmm. So having the Youth Forum, back to your point, I think another event that Egypt will host also next year, that's like on a global scale, it's going to be the very COP. important, is the COP yeah. at the end of the year. So I think this is an, an excellent opportunity also for Egypt to start not only showing the world what it can do in terms of the organization, but also in terms of harnessing and listening to the voices and actually taking on its own um, you know, responsibility the mission of transcending or translating these ideas, these proposals mm -hmm. that come from the youth, from the different parts of the world in the COP itself. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, this is again a major challenge that Egypt is up to, that Egypt can definitely deliver on. But in order to do so, we need to engage the youth, not only from within the country, because again, Egypt is very rich in mm -hmm. terms of its human resources throughout the country, all over the country, but also in terms of events as, uh, as such, global events that can also host attract and work with the youth from the different countries of the world. Yes, uh, being a professor and dealing with the youth on daily basis hmm. and uh, uh, trying of course to bring the best out of them, to work on their strong points and uh, we're always, you know, clicking on the words like creativity, hmm. uh, bringing about uh, the sense of creativity out of them. Even the slogan of the World Youth Forum comes like with uh, create and, and go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how, is, how about this sense of uh, relationship between the uh, professor and the youth? How can we like click on their strong points in your opinion, Professor Fahmi? Bring out their ideas and... Well, I think, you know, yeah. seeing the different generations throughout the past, I would say two decades, yeah. um, you know, Egypt, I think has been blessed really with a very innovative generation, mm -hmm. a huge potential in the different sectors. You know, this wave of globalization that Egypt has witnessed, just like the rest of the world over the past 20 years, cannot really go unnoticed. You know, these youth have a, a lot of potential. They're very, you know, skilled in many areas. They're open to the world. You know, more often than not, one is really surprised by the amount of knowledge and exposure they have, but they do need guidance. Mm -hmm. They do need a lot of enculturation, uh, knowledge, uh, you know, uh, support, they need to be put on the right track. And I think 
the state and the society also should play a major role in that process. But Egypt's youth, uh, amazing potential, really, in so many different fields. But they need guidance, and we need to work with them to reach these areas. You know, today, I think, you know, when you look at the achievements, the innovation that we see in sectors such as the small and medium industries, you see these yeah. knowledge hubs of a lot of startups coming from within the country, there's a lot of promise there. Mm -hmm. a huge promise from uh, from the youth. Um, but again, it's an opportunity that we should be capitalizing upon. Yeah. How about spreading this sense of awareness among uh, the youth, talking with them frankly and uh, talking with them with the full sense of, of transparency? One of the most successful sessions, uh, if we are going to make a flashback at the World mm -hmm. Youth Forum, was uh, the session entitled Ask the President, mm. uh, which has been really very fruitful, you know. They were asking the President without any uh, sense of shyness, and uh, it was like uh, this, this direct uh, dialogue between yeah. the leader yeah. and the youth in full sense of transparency. How do you see the, uh, the effect or the impact of such wonderful sessions on the youth themselves? More, mm -hmm. more of the same, please. Yeah, I mean, definitely, mm -hmm. much needed. For a very long time, you know, the youth are really, uh, you know, they also perceive themselves as they are outside this official process. You know, the, those are the elderly, they take the decisions, they run the country, and we only receive or are at the receiving ends of these actions. And that's very problematic because, you know, this divide, if it keeps on going, they've, they will feel left out, mm -hmm. the feeling of belonging or feeling of dedication and loyalty to the country may be affected so it's, it's very important for them to feel that they're part of what's taking place so more of these sessions are definitely needed of course when they sit with um, you know the higher echelons of the country and they feel that they are treasured they are appreciated as adults that they can be listened to that they can also have a dialogue with but also importantly if their ideas are you know taken into consideration when mm -hmm. it comes to the Lots of policies. their ideas had actually been uh, translated uh, into, into action actions, and exactly. taken into consideration exactly. by the president. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, having more of that, you know, and, and also widening this to exist, not only in terms of the youth forum, but also throughout the country. You know, we need to have the different youthful segments from within Upper Egypt today, for instance. We, I think you guys just you showed this uh, clip mm -hmm. where there were also meetings with the youth from Upper Egypt. This is very important for them to feel Mm -hmm. but they're also part of the decision-making process. So definitely, more of that will only lead to positive outcomes, yes. Yes, uh, more concerning also providing them with, uh, with job opportunities because mm -hmm. it's very important to prepare the youth today uh, for the labor market and uh, to, to put to them certain senses of incentives mm -hmm. in order to encourage them to keep on going. Uh, we have uh, uh, changed the face of life in Egypt through the different uh, the smart cities that mm. uh, Egypt has established with the new administrative capital on top of the list. How do you see their chances in such huge projects, especially the smart cities today? Well, I think one of the things that, this, that the government is doing right now is that you're creating these massive spaces for action mm -hmm. through the different, as you mentioned, the cities, the smart hubs. But it's also important for us to try as much as possible to link that with real opportunities for the youth in terms of job creating investment. So I mean investment is there and we have a lot of interest from again MNCs, from corporations from the region and elsewhere but we should also be paying attention and this is I think, also starting to happen what kind of opportunities are there and also what kind of educational system can we uh, establish and develop to help the youth also um, you know, shine in these different sectors. We're not only talking about basic education, giving mm -hmm. them the chance to read properly and write properly, and this is also very important, and also very important for them to know more about their own country in terms of their own history and culture, mm -hmm. religion, mm -hmm. very important. But the, it's also important for us to try as much as possible to modify or to adjust the educational system in a way that also serves the labor market. I think for a while this has been lacking in Egypt. This is again a great opportunity to today because there are clear-cut sectors that are apparently in need of more uh, input in terms of human resources. So mentioning, for instance, the IT sector, mentioning, as you rightly highlight, the smart cities, the mm -hmm. 
these are areas that are clearly in need. You know, vocational training, for instance, very important. Yes. It's, it's starting to happen, but again, more of that and, is And needed. the culture concerning vocational training mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that uh, how far we can make it like quite acceptable, because at a certain timing, it was like uh, another sort of education that has been the preferential one. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, the problem here is that you have actually Technical people, education, I mean, attention yeah. to technical education. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. well, vocational mm -hmm. is, is and, and vocational, quite yeah. mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, technical, diverse. Yeah. Um, but for a very long time here, this was also a waste of resources because you have the youth actually graduating from different schools, whether from commerce or from engineering, or, and then they end up taking their own learning in the job market, on the job. This is a waste of resources in terms of the, uh, of the output that they provide in these places, and also in terms of the resources, the financial, the educational resources that were wasted, given them their degrees in areas that they don't really utilize. Uh, you know, in the end. So having this sort of orientation that this is also an opportunity for the youth now to invest in the educational sector, in vocational and technical training, but it's also profitable because they will, they will not only learn these uh, you know, professions and, you know, go and, and, and sit at home, they will use these skills in the job market and it's quite profitable, these areas of the skilled and technical workers and it's, and it's only through skilled and technical workers that you can build a developed economy so mm -hmm. again these mega projects that are happening are a great opportunity for that to happen hopefully this will also be coupled with a lot of um, job market adjustment in terms of the educational system yes uh, talking about the youth the expats uh, because when mm -hmm. they are uh, usually on uh, uh, on a journey back home they uh, yes they enjoy the atmosphere but we would like also to uh, lay special emphasis about this sense of belonging to the nation how can we uh, like have this uh, link continuous between the youth abroad and um, here uh, their, with their country with their homeland this sense of belonging how do you see that and also with a global outlook uh, concerning branding Egypt because um, it, it is very important talking about branding the country globally. Of course. Mm -hmm. You know, I think no matter where you go today in Europe and North America and the Arab world and you know Australia, you do have thriving Egyptian communities in these different places. Yes. And these communities exist and thrive on many levels. You know, some of them are lower a sort of maybe working class Egyptians, especially in the Arab region, but then when you go to Europe and North America, Latin America, even you have a lot of, you know, skilled and well-educated university professors, and this is again a great resource, mm -hmm. a great resource that we can and we should capitalize on, you know, further. It's, I think it's starting with ministries such as the Ministry of you know, Egyptians abroad and so far, you know, migration and yeah, so uh, forth. Yes, Ministry of uh, Immigration. Yeah. Immigration, yes. Yeah. So this is important, but I think we need more of that because this is, I think a lot of work needs to be done in order to be able to and harness and utilize the innovation that they may have. A lot of them have great ideas mm -hmm. for how to move forward in sectors that are very critical for Egypt, you know, engineering and, you know, even, you know, you know in physics and sciences and social studies, even, you know, a great potential. Yeah. So I think we need, we need more than one ministry, maybe. We need maybe two or three different ministries to be able to and, and harness this. But I mean, seriously, this is really a great resource, you know, because the, those people also love the country a lot and are willing and able to invest, if called upon, to actually, uh, you know, provide and help and work with, um, with, with, uh, with the government to further, and also with the civil society to further the interests of, um, of development. Yes, uh, definitely uh, more than one angle that we can work on and uh, Egypt always affirms uh, the, uh, the support of the different organizations like for instance the UN efforts uh, in supporting and promoting sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. uh, Egypt is working with lots of organizations. Uh, today UNICEF marks 75 years yes. uh, in, in Egypt. Well, uh, uh, real support on behalf of the organizations that the country is working with in order to promote developmental goals, uh, Professor Fahmi. Yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a win-win situation. It's a mutually beneficial process. Mm -hmm. You know, for these international organizations, especially the UN, to be able to support developing countries such as Egypt properly. There has to be a very strong partnership and collaboration on the state level. Mm -hmm. And also for Egypt to benefit from 
um, you know, what such organizations can bring, it's also important to work in tandem with them, very close coordination. Um, you know, most recently, the Egyptian Human Development Report was issued by the UNDP in a big, you know, celebration. And uh, so, I mean, further, of course, the event was important, but it's also important for us, for the people of the country and for the civil society and for the government to use this wealth of knowledge that was produced by the UNDP in the Egypt Human Development Report, because the data is important. The mm -hmm. data is where we need to you know, look at, know where we're standing and how we can move forward. That's one example, of course, talking about UNICEF, again, another great UN organization, a lot that can be done. Egypt, again, is a country that has a lot of challenges when it comes to um, you know, women empowerment, to child protection. These are areas that are very important. And again, this partnership on the local and the regional level with entities such as UNICEF and other UN bodies are, is very, very important. Yes. Uh, finally, while wrapping up, as the president had said it earlier in the day, and he said that uh, uh, all what has been achieved uh, it has been a dream and it came true through the people's uh, awareness and the sense of determination and their love for this country. So the president is always uh, giving credit to the Egyptian people and their role uh, in the development that we see today. Oh, well, definitely. Mm -hmm. Egypt is, is, is a country that's quite uh, rich in its uh, human resources. You know, ever since the dawn of history, really. So, uh, and there's more to come. There is, uh, again, like we started today, the episode talking about Upper Egypt. This is really a treasure of human uh, resources that we need to dig into, that we will hopefully start to dig into. And again, all over the country, really, a lot, a lot can be, you know, sought, a lot can be expected, hopefully, in the coming period, and more of that, hopefully, in the coming 10 years and more. Yes, hopefully. I thank you very much, Professor Dr. Thanks. Mohamed Fahmi, Professor of Economics and Political Science. My pleasure. Thank uh, you. Always me. adding value through your Thanks contribution. Thank, thank you. you. And I thank you, dear viewers, for joining us. Uh, I'm Tahirid Hussain. Many thanks for watching.